So, welcome everybody to the third day of the second international conference on the fall season of Meyer. Um, today's <coughs> sessions are dedicated to the memory and honor of a, a vital member of the community here in Carbondale, and I'm speaking of Louis Edwin Hahn. He was born in uh, 1908, and he passed away in 2008, that's right, 2008, so, uh, no, 2006, he was almost 100. Anyway, uh, Louis Hahn studied under Stephen Pepper at Berkeley uh, and got his PhD in 1939, and I got to know him at conferences where he was uh, a constant presence for years and years and years, and I found him to be one of the most interesting people in the philosophy profession, and part of the reason was that by the time I met him, uh, he was already the editor of the Library of Living Philosophers, which he became in 1981 upon the retirement of Paul Schilp, who founded this. Now, since not all of you are in the philosophy profession, you may not know what the Library of Living Philosophers is, but it was the brainchild of Paul Arthur Schilp, who, um, thought that if you could put together volumes in which the best critics of uh, an extraordinary philosopher could ask them critical questions and get responses, you could, put to, you could put to bed an awful lot of needless future discussion. And so uh, Schilp went to John Dewey and said, would you, actually went to Bergson first, but Bergson said he couldn't do it. Uh, and so uh, uh, to John Dewey and said, you know, would you be willing to participate in this? And so the first volume of the Library of Living Philosophers mm -hmm. came out in 1939. We are to volume 34 or something like that now. Uh, and uh, the most, really some of the most prominent people of the 20th century, <coughs> Sartre, Popper, uh, Whitehead, Santayana, uh, the list of superlative, Martin Buber, the list of superlative people who have done these volumes is at Kassir, uh, is, uh, is quite a long list. And so anyway, um, when I was, had applied for this job at Carbondale in 2001, Lewis was getting too old to do it uh, anymore because he was 92 or something. And anyway, I had talked to him at every conference asking him what volume is going on now, et cetera, et cetera. He's come out at the uh, irregular interval, intervals, but it takes about 10 years to do one of these. Um, and so anyway, uh, his health failed, and they needed somebody at Carbondale with significant editorial experience, and that's why I got the job. I fit their description of idealism and process philosophy in the American tradition, but the reason I got the job was because Lewis was kind enough to light up when they said I was a candidate. Uh, and so anyway, I got to spend about well, well, one year as the assistant editor, and then he was still semi-available until he passed away. Um, but in any case, got to know him well, and he was a dear friend. Now, he was also the secretary treasurer of the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity oh. and the Central Division Society, which he also passed on to me, and so that was in 2000 when he retired from that. So part of the connection has to do with the fact that the Foundation for the Philosophy of Creativity is deeply indebted to Lewis Hahn for his service. I believe he was the first secretary treasurer in 1957, and I'm the second. And so, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, when he passed away, uh, we got together, the foundation board and the societies, and decided to create a lecture series that was in his honor. I think our first one was 2009, uh, and then the next one was 2012. But since then, we've been, especially since AIPCT came into existence, we've been doing it every, every year. The format was initially we would just have a prominent person come in uh, and honor them um, with, you know, with you're the Han lecturer this year, t talk about whatever you want to talk about. Um, uh, but what happened was uh, a number of years ago, the foundation board met and decided to expand the format, which is we didn't feel we were honoring our Han lecturers enough. And so somebody, I don't know who, came up, came up with the idea that if we had an early career uh, person, a mid-career person, talk about our lecturer and, uh, uh, and, their, and, and his or her work, 
uh, that that would be a good format for the Han lectures. They've always been in high summer. Normally it's July. And one of the things that's surprising, Carbondale is empty in the summer. There are no students and the place is pretty sleepy. But we've always had big crowds for the Han lectures. And so anyway, for in recent years, um, uh, uh, we've been doing the three lectures, and that's what you're going to see today. Now, obviously, the choice of our Han lecturer this year had something to do with Langer. But it's not limited to Langer, because today we're here to honor the work and career of Bob Innes, which he will tell us whether we have done <laughs> when, when this is over. But so that is what is happening today. And back to the audience. <laughs> and actually, so this, this, this session is being uh, sponsored by the endowed chair in the Communication Studies Department, which I am fortunate to occupy. Uh, and it was uh, endowed by William S. Minor, who was the founder of, the, of the, all these creativity society things. And so the William S. Minor chair is, but I always have to say the whole thing. It's actually the William and Galia Minor chair because he, he and his sister um, uh, uh, did that. But I'm a minor professor now. <laughs> and, and I have to say the whole thing. And he's like, yeah, I'm a minor professor, um, which is true, but, <laughs> but in, in all senses of the word. But anyway, so they, they are actually the founders of this particular feast today. Um, so when I invited Bob, um, uh, uh, he said, oh, I don't know, who's going to talk about me? I'm like, oh, I can, that's, that's easier than you think, Bob. Uh, and so, uh, so anyway, it was pretty obvious uh, what one choice would be, who I'll talk about in a little bit. But the other choice might be a little less obvious, because you guys haven't met Jared yet, but you're about to. Um, uh, nevertheless, uh, uh, the person I'm now going to introduce is, I guess I'll set this aside. It's funny, I've given away all of Jared's books, including the one I did with him. And so I'm going to pick up copies at my office when we're at SIU today, and I'll bring them here and put them on the table so that you can, so that you can look at that. Um, and I actually took some to Poland, uh, and they exist there. So I have plenty of copies of Jared's books, but not in this house. Uh, so, so in any case, Jared came to us. He went to Bradley as an undergraduate and came to his MA and PhD in philosophy at SIU. Uh, he's interested in just about everything, but he ended up writing his dissertation on Kassira. Uh It's a really good professional move to write your dissertation on Kassira. The only way you could do worse is to write on white it. And, and so, uh, so anyway, but Jared, nevertheless, he wasn't worried about it, and neither am I, because uh, he had choices. <coughs> and you'll see why shortly. Uh, not only is he charming and good looking, uh, uh, but, uh, <laughs> but also, in addition to this, uh, uh, an incredibly fluid philosopher. Um, uh, I disagreed with a number of things in his dissertation, and we just argued. And of course, they remain. <laughs> but, uh, but these are really hot, sort of high level disagreements in the sense that we could both be right, we could both be wrong. It's, I mean, there aren't even contradictions. Just tensions in the thought of Kassir, especially as related to the concept of person, and Gabriel Marcel, which was the other topic. So he used Marcel's personalism to interpret Kassir. Uh, since that time, uh, he decided to stay in this area. He didn't have to. Uh, but uh, he teaches at Rin Lake College, uh, where he is the sole tenured philosophy professor. Uh, but it's kind of cool because that means nobody tells you what to teach. <laughs> so, uh, so in any case, and that's about an hour north of here, um, uh, uh, straight up by 57, uh, surrounded by the third snakiest lake in Illinois. Um, did you know that? No. <laughs> Somebody measured the snakes. Your lake is the third snakiest lake in Illinois. Uh, were you going to go see the number one, number two? We, we were at the beach just a week or two ago, so it's good to know. Okay, <laughs> so it's really quite a beautiful lake, though. It's just crawling with snakes. Uh, but most snakes are our friends. Snakes are good. Anyway, uh, so Jared, uh, Jared did. Um, is there anyone in here who contributed to the personal objects? What? Did Myron get No, he didn't. was a referee for it. <laughs> anyway, uh, he put together what I regard as uh, one of the most interesting books to come out in a long time called The Cultural Power of Personal Objects. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and it's all about how it is that, um, well, this house is full of them. Uh, it's how, how it is that cultural objects take on personhood mm -hmm. and personality. Uh, and so anyway, but, the, but I don't know, 15, 17 contributors from 
all over the you know the the spectrum philosophy, Eastern philosophy, all kinds of things. Uh, and then later, he and I did the book Queen and philosophy, but it was mainly Jared. Um, uh, and so we both loved the rock band Queen. And uh, so anyway. Um, it has been a delight to have him remain in the area so that we can see each other once in a while. And I knew immediately um, that, that Jared's the right guy to talk about Bob Ennis. So with that said, I'm going to turn it over to Jared Kimling, and I hope you get a chance to uh, meet and talk during the breaks and uh, while we're having lunch today. Uh, so Jared, take it over. Okay. Well, that was a disconcerting amount of nice things to hear Randy say about me uh, right before I'm going to talk. So I'll take a breath here and try and relax a little bit. That's, you know, probably the nicest he's ever been to me. Uh, well, thank you guys for having me. It's a pleasure to be here, and it's nice to see so many faces here at, the, at a, what is essentially a Langer conference, right? It's nice to see Langer scholarship doing so well. Yeah. Uh, so... As you said, my name is Jared, Jared Kemling, and the title of this talk is Innis in Focus. Bit of a play there. You gotta include a pun, right? Uh, moving toward a presentational philosophy. So I'll talk more about this idea of a presentational philosophy, but thanks again for being here and welcome to this panel for the Lewis Hahn Lectures. Um, so. I am going to just read through this. I'm not a huge fan of just the stand and read, but for the sake of formality, I want to make sure that everybody hears everything here. I will try and move as quickly as possible so that we have space for Q&A afterwards, right? Uh, the constant touchstone of my talk is going to be Innes' authoritative text, Susan Langer in Focus, the symbolic mind, thus the pun for the Innes in Focus here. In the interest of time, as I said, I'm going to keep my praise for the book relatively brief, but since we are here to talk about Bob, I will just quickly say uh, I highly recommend it as a comprehensive and insightful overview of nearly the entirety of Langer's output, pretty much everything that you would want to know about Langer, you can learn from that book. Uh, he definitely situates Langer's thought in relation to a number of other traditions and thinkers, including, among many others, Ernst Cassirer's idealistic philosophy of culture, the process thought of Alfred North Whitehead, and the pragmatism of Charles Sanders Peirce and John Dewey. For someone like myself, who just so happens to fall right in the center of that particular Venn diagram, uh, there's no better perspective from which to view Langer's work. Right? Anyone else here right in the middle of the, you know, the Kassir, Whitehead, uh, Dewey circle? Yeah, uh, there might be a few of us. Uh, so it's my understanding that my talk will be followed up by a response from Bob, and I'm interested to hear how that goes, <laughs> as well as a general discussion from the group. So as I said, I'm going to try and go through this as quickly as possible so that we have time for that Q&A. But feel free to stop at any time, interrupt me, raise your hand, shout out. If you need me to repeat something or clarify something, I'm happy to do that. Okay, so I'm going to give you a brief sketch, and then I'm going to just launch into it. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to cover three basic questions. The first question, and th this is all meant to be a little bit provocative and iconoclastic, just to have some fun. So first question, has academic philosophy truly accomplished the transition to the new key that Langer heralded? Right? philosophy in the new key? My answer is going to be, briefly, shortly, <laughs> no. <laughs> right? Yeah. We didn't do it. Uh, so, second question, what must be done to accomplish such a transition? I'm going to suggest, and this is all very brief and sketched out um, as much as we can do in the, the brief time that I have here, but I'm going to suggest that philosophy needs to be developed as an art and as a presentational form in Langer's terms. To put another way, philosophy needs to be developed further as a practice and as a way of life rather than a largely rational historical enterprise. So that's part two. Part three, what would the primary illusion and the basic abstraction of such an art form be? Right? So taking some of this basic Langer terminology here, how, how would we work this out? And this, I'm very interested to hear what you guys say because you'll probably have much more interesting things to say on this than I will. So I'm very curious how this discussion plays out. 
So in a very limited sketch, I'm going to suggest that the primary illusion of what we might call presentational philosophy, so presentational philosophy, philosophy as a presentational form, I'm going to suggest that the primary illusion might be wisdom. So that's the illusion that we're shooting for in philosophy, in presentational philosophy. And the basic abstraction might be wonder. So these very basic concepts of what does it mean to do philosophy. So this is, in a lot of ways, a metaphilosophical discussion. All right? Gotcha. So getting into it, section one, the new key of meaning. So I'm going to try and move through the historical stuff and the analytic stuff and get to the more creative stuff at the end, but got to do your homework first, right? Perhaps the major focus of Langer's early works, and indeed her entire career, is the premise that philosophy should be understood as the study of meanings. Maybe my favorite thing that Langer ever did or said, right? Meaning here understood as, to dramatically simplify, the experience of feeling or the experience or feeling of relations and connections among events, which cohere into patterns or forms of such relations. So feeling the connections and the relations in our experience. Where the various sciences are concerned with facts and causal connections, philosophy, and perhaps all of the humanities, question mark, must be concerned with meanings and logical connections. I'm, I'm not going to... Uh, include every citation here, but uh, a lot of these citations will be quotes directly taken from Bob's book or quoted in Bob's book from Langer herself. Okay. <clears throat> so, uh, must be concerned with meanings and logical connections. To put that another way, if science sees the world as a milieu of real facts, philosophy must learn to see the world as a milieu of ideal symbols, real facts, ideal symbols. And indeed, it is this idea of philosophy as the study of meaning and the study of symbols as the experiential nexus of meaning that Langer champions and heralds in philosophy in a new key. She believes that thinkers as diverse as Kassir, Whitehead, Peirce, Freud, and Wittgenstein have all turned to a philosophy in this new symbolic key, and that such will be the tenor of philosophy moving forward. Indeed, we could easily look at the philosophy of that period and agree with Langer that there was a burgeoning movement, exemplified from the existentialists and to the semioticians, the pragmatists to the hermeneuticists, the aestheticians to the logicians, and the linguistic turn of the logical positivists and the logical atomists. Everywhere you look in the early to mid 20th century are thinkers concerned with meaning, symbols, and the logic of relations. Although, of course, we should be wary of over-romanticizing the past, right? This, maybe, <laughs> it's not fair to say that everything was perhaps moving in this direction, but it definitely seems to be an identifiable trend. So my question then is, what happened? Right? Th that's where we were going. This was, the, this was the movement, philosophy in a new key. How did we go back to the same old key? <laughs> or a new, even... Worst key, or <laughs> however we want to talk about it, right? Um, okay, so again, I'd like to reemphasize the things I'm about to say are purposefully a bit strident and iconoclastic. I'm trying to be interesting and fun. So this is a bit tongue in cheek, but it's the sort of thing that I actually mean, but you're probably not supposed to say uh, in a public setting. <laughs> so I don't think um, to baldly state a potentially controversial position that the vitality of Langer's day has carried forward into the present state of philosophy, and academic philosophy in particular. I'm mostly talking about academic philosophy, of course. I don't think that we're still functioning in the new key that Langer described. Not only is philosophy not concerning itself with studying meanings, I worry that academic philosophy as an activity itself is no longer meaningful for many people, at least the way it's often being done. In the academy, with few exceptions, we don't train philosophers to pursue a meaningful life. <laughs> right? I mean, if, if that is the purpose of philosophy, as Langer so rightly says, 
shouldn't that be what we're teaching young philosophers and anyone who wanders into the classroom to, to live a meaningful life? Yeah, I, I'm not sure, right, if, if we're living up to that, that high ideal there. So we don't necessarily train philosophers to pursue a meaningful life. We don't teach people that that's what philosophy is about. Meaning making is not the focus of our classes and we don't seek to instill it in our students. It's not the goal of our research programs and it's not something that we expect to find when reading a journal or attending a conference. 90% of academic philosophy, just a random statistic that I made up, 90% of academic philosophy is a desiccated husk of dry historicism. This is, the, this is the fun bit, right? Drained of the juices of vitality and meaning. Too often, the academy functions as a walled garden of self-sustaining reciprocal systems that serve only to perpetuate the continued existence of this lurching thing. <laughs> oh, yeah, good, yeah, Stand, round of applause, there we go. I, I, thought I, I thought I was safe to, to be a bit poetic here in the front of this group, yeah. <laughs> So, those who do manage to carve out a life of meaning making in the academy, and I would uh, count, even though I don't know everyone here, those in this room as some of those rare few, they must do that in spite of the system, not as a result of the system. Right? So, how did we get here? It's always difficult to make generalizations about one's own epoch, and at the end of the day, I'm not primarily interested in the whys and the hows that have gotten us here. But if pressed, I'd venture to guess, you know, in an American context at least, we have the same old culprits. Something to do with the professionalization of the modern academy, particularly as influenced by Cold War era political pressures, the state of contemporary global capitalism, the dominance of scientific objectivating knowledge as a symbolic form. You know, all of these, these old hobby horses. Uh, in other words, people go to college to get jobs, make money and contribute in culturally valuable, read, at least in our country, STEM, usually, fields. In such a dominant milieu, it can be tricky to argue for the cultural cachet of pausing to ask, what does it all mean? You know, <laughs> that, that philosophers get the intro to philosophy class that everyone always makes fun of. What does it all mean? You ask a student that and they just look at you. What do you mean? Right? <laughs> and thus, philosophy has adapted. Right? We've adapted. Are we teaching people to live meaningful lives the way that Langer thought that we ought to be? Okay. But if we seriously approach Langer's claim that philosophy is about making life meaningful, then what are we to do? I would argue that to revitalize philosophy, we need to see it not solely as a discursive catalog of statements that may once have been meaningful, but as an art that elaborates its own form of feeling. Okay. So, presentational philosophy and discursive philosophy, and this is just a bit of scene setting that probably everyone here knows better than I do, but I, I have to say it just to, just to get to the, the juicy stuff, right? Or maybe this is the juicy stuff for some of you. I'm not sure. Uh, one of Langer's greatest features is that she understands that meaning is broader than purely linguistic discursive forms of symbolic thinking. Right? Meaning is broader than mere linguistics, which is a radical thing to say, you know, at, at the height of the linguistic turn in some ways. But, okay. So, uh, yeah, I don't want to get too deep into a formal analysis of Langer's system. I don't want to tell you guys things that you know better than me. But to make some sense of the point, uh, I'll have to do some scene setting. As of philosophy in a new key, Langer has divided meaning-bearing or significant relationships into two broad categories, indication and symbolization. And again, all of this, uh, I'm drawing quotes from Bob's book, and these are themes that he very deftly highlights. So... All of this is drawn from his work. So, signs or indices are paired with their objects in a one-to-one -one correlation. And there's a number of quotes here again that I'm not going to bog things down with. But paired with their objects in a one-to-one -one correlation. The relation is thus subject-sign-object, with the sign pointing to or standing in for the object in a direct and unmediated way. Symbols, meanwhile, are mediated by the conception of the object. The relation is therefore subject, symbol, concept, object. 
The symbol does not point to the object. It is a vehicle for the conception of objects. Langer, thus, is broadly similar. Oh, I knew that was going to happen. I'll put it up here. OK, uh, Langer, then, is broadly similar to Peirce's usage of these terms, if we set aside the place of iconicity in Langer's thought. OK, broadly similar to Peirce. Don't nobody hang me up for that. Are we OK with that? OK, we're OK with that. <laughs> uh, for now, let's also set aside indication and focus, as Langer does, primarily on symbolization. So we're going to talk about symbolization here. Importantly, she subdivides the category of symbol into discursive and presentational forms, creating what Innes describes as two essentially different forms of symbolization. In fact, two different dimensions of rationality. That's an interesting... Uh, okay, symbolization, rationality. Um, discursive thought is exemplified primarily for Langer in the form of language. Discursive is a rather vague term in philosophy, but let's assume that Langer has in mind both the conversational sense, that of having a discourse, as well as the related logical sense of analytic thinking, which divides experience into atomic parts in relation. Okay, so we have the, the sort of standard linguistic and then also the logical sense of discourse. The term discursive, in this sense, suffers from the same complex web of logico-linguistic meanings found in the Greek concept of logos. The characteristics of true language, and thus we assume discursive symbolization in general, are one, the presence of a vocabulary and syntax, two, the ability to construct a dictionary, and three, the possibility of translation from one language to another. Or, as Innes helpfully elucidates, one, there must be a repertoire of independent or relatively freestanding units of meaning that are combined according to rules. Two, the single units are able to be defined in terms of other units or combinations thereof. And three, the relationships between languages are defined by overlapping rather than overlappings rather than coincidence. Okay. So these three basic characteristics of what Langer calls a true language. So Cartesian style mechanistic philosophy is discursive in this sense. The logical atomism of Russell and the early Wittgenstein are intended to purify philosophy into a fully discursive system. And Innes observes that discursive thought leads to scientific knowledge and to a theory of knowledge focused on a critique of science. Okay, so there is one form of symbolization that is analytic. It breaks experience down into a language of freestanding units or atoms of meaning. But what Langer calls presentational symbolization, however, does not work according to such linguistic conventions. As Innes observes, a picture, for instance, does not have any fundamental building blocks with independent meanings. Whereas language's meanings unfold or is presented successively, presentational symbols are composed of meanings in a simultaneous and integrated way. Thus, discursive symbolization is experienced as linear, while presentational symbolism is experienced as a gestalt, a complexly integrated whole. Whereas science exemplifies discursive symbolization, it is ritual, myth, and perhaps most importantly for Langer, art, that exemplify presentational symbolization. As Innes states, art does not belong to the discursive realm, and hence its meanings and ideas cannot be said, but only shown. This distinction between meanings that are said versus meanings that are shown may be a helpful shorthand for remembering the distinction between discursive and presentational forms. I like that, said versus shown. Right. We might also think of the two in terms of creating models versus images. This is another helpful heuristic. Where an image shows how something appears, a model shows how something works. Thus, discursive symbols function as models. They show you how something works. Whereas presentational symbols function as images. So before we dive into a deeper exploration of art and presentational symbolization, I want to return to my central problematic, namely the failure of philosophy to continue singing in the new key that Langer announced. Because in order to return philosophy to its proper key, I believe we need to ask an important question. Is philosophy a discursive form of symbolization or a presentational form of symbolization? 
I think we can all agree that it is a means of making symbols, right? It is a symbol making activity. So is it presentational or is it discursive? Or we could say, is philosophy a science or an art, <laughs> right? That, that old divide. Is it a language as we tried so hard to make it in the 20th century? Or is it a song or a dance or a painting or something like this, right? Note that I'm not asking whether philosophy should use language. I'm asking if it should be a language in the sense that we just outlined, i.e. an atomistic system of meanings in relation. There are many arts which use word and other linguistic meanings as Langer's discussion of poetry and literature in feeling and form makes clear. So it's not a question of whether philosophy uses language. Obviously it can use language, but is it itself logically a language? A poem makes meaning in a presentational way, not a discursive way, or at least not solely in a discursive way. So my question is, should philosophy make meaning in a presentational way or in a discursive way? So my instinct here is that philosophy, and read here, Eurocentric, post-enlightenment, academic philosophy, right, <laughs> has been overly dominated by discursive rationality. Is that a shock? Is that shocking? It doesn't sound shocking. doesn't sound shocking, right? Uh, and if we want philosophy to return to Langer's new key, it might behoove us to work out a form of presentational philosophy. Now, I should acknowledge at the start that there's nothing fundamentally wrong with the discursive impulse in philosophy, at least when it's done well. After all, discursive <coughs> symbolization is still a mode of meaning making at heart. So weaving a tapestry of historical relationships between concepts, thinkers, and philosophical movements does create meaning for those who care to engage in it. Building up a language of philosophy, complete with vocabulary, syntax, dictionary, and translation, does hold up a certain sense of meaning. So here's where I'm trying to throw up my, it's a, you know, I'm not here to attack anyone. It's okay, we can do our historicism, we can do our rational projects. Um, but is that all we should be doing? That's the question. So it can be wonderfully illuminating to read a text that demonstrates how Schelling and Hegel are extending and modifying a concept of God that they inherit from the German mystics. Right? Do we remember that? Everybody always forgets that one. It's hard to truly understand the impact of communism without going back to the notion of dialectic that Marx inherited from Hegel, and so on. These are all valid connections that create a web of relations and thus an experience of meaning. Right? So you can do discursive philosophy and it can be meaningful. I'm not trying to deny that. However, there is a difference between the history of philosophy and the practice of philosophy. I'm going to, I'll say it again. There's a difference between the history of philosophy and the practice of philosophy. This, this is a point that I make to my students constantly, but it's something that I feel like the academy largely ignores. Right? What we have become is sort of an art department that only teaches the history of art without ever teaching people to make art. We teach people the history of philosophy, but we never teach them to do philosophy, which seems strange. And then we wonder why our students don't seem that interested in Kant. Well, why would they be? Of course, there's a value in art history. My wife has a master's in art history, so don't, don't get mad. Don't get mad. There's a value in art history, even for those who don't make their own art. Just as there should be a value in the history of philosophy, even for those who don't themselves philosophize. But the value, I think, is so much greater when the history can actually inform your practice. Not to mention that the analogy breaks down to the extent that art has the benefit of being more intuitive for most people and introduced at a younger age. So most people have a sense of what was involved in painting the Sistine Chapel and can thus develop a sense of appreciation they don't have any idea what's going on in the first critique, you know? Uh, so it's a little bit easier to teach them art appreciation than philosophy appreciation without any practice back behind it. So, but rather than, teach them, rather than teach them what philosophy actually is, we just keep throwing the history books at them, hoping that it'll stick. So while I do think there is some value in discursive philosophy, especially for advanced practitioners, I think that the modern academy is way too unbalanced in favor of discursivity. If we want to make philosophy sing in Langer's new key, or if we want philosophy to truly develop as the practice par excellence of making our lives meaningful, 
that's what philosophy is, is making our lives meaningful, then I would suggest we place much more emphasis on developing a presentational philosophy. So what does it actually mean to do philosophy? Not just talk about the history of it. What were those people in the history books actually doing when they were creating all those things that now we sit around and talk about? So what would it mean if philosophy were more of an art than a science, if we actually started painting instead of just talking about paintings? All right, so abstraction and illusion. We get into the technical discussion here. So hopefully this is fun, or at least I'll move through it quickly. While Langer commits a significant amount of effort to the analysis of presentational forms such as ritual and myth, it is art that seems to be her preferred example of how a presentational form should work. Thus, in working out how philosophy might make meaning in a presentational rather than discursive way, it makes sense that we ought to look first and foremost at Langer's understanding of art as a presentational symbolic form. In other words, how do we turn philosophy into an art as Langer understood it? Langer's discussion of artistic forms centers around two key concepts, the basic abstraction of that art and the primary illusion that such an abstraction affects. In what follows, I'll provide a very brief overview of these two concepts before elaborating on how I think they might apply to this idea of a presentational philosophy. Abstraction, as Langer says, is the comprehension of form itself through its exemplification in informed perceptions or intuitions. Abstraction is the comprehension of form itself. What an interesting definition of abstraction, by the way. Put briefly, abstraction is a process by which a mind comprehends or grasps the various forms which structure our experience. This could be the standard mode of generalizing abstraction that we tend to think of when we think of abstraction. Could also be abstraction via metaphor or any other means of grasping a form. So if you are grasping at a form, you are abstracting. The basic, the basic abstraction of an art transforms the actual experience into a virtual one, or what Langer calls a semblance. Innes, expanding on Langer's discussion of dance, states that the basic abstraction of all the arts involves the creation of a scheingefu, the semblance of a feeling. So all of the arts are creating a semblance of some feeling, feeling in the big Langer, Langerian sense, right? A semblance is disconnected or detached from its surroundings. It's a form of othering within experience, marked by strangeness, separateness, otherness. Thus, abstraction creates a sheer image in which everything is imaginary. This break with its embedded system into an isolated image is roughly what Langer means by the virtual, a term borrowed and, of course, uh, popularized by Bergson. Is that okay? Can I say that? Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. <clears throat> As an image, a semblance is a rendering of the appearance of its object in one perspective out of many possible ones. It sets forth what the object looks or seems like, and according to its own style, it emphasizes separ separations or continuities, contacts or gradations, details, complexities, or simple masses. Okay, that's a lot, right? We don't have time. We don't have time. Each art, therefore, has its own method of abstraction, its own way of grasping form. And conversely, each art has its own image form that it elaborates in the process of that abstraction. Such image forms are the primary illusions that are created by that abstraction. So we have a, a grasping out towards a form, and then we have the form that is being abstracted towards. These primary illusions are always a form, symbol, image, semblance. We have a whole uh, nexus of technical terms here. But of feeling, of feeling, a form of feeling, a symbol of feeling, an image of feeling, a semblance of feeling in some mode or another. What does that mean? Well, put briefly, feeling is whatever is felt in any way as sensory stimulus or inward tension, pain, emotion, or intent. It is the whole realm of human awareness and thought, the sense of absurdity, the sense of justice, the perception of meaning, 
as well as emotion and sensation. So two nice quotes from Langer there. In other words, we can crudely understand it as experience in a Deweyan context, for example, or just as the activity of mind or awareness. Feeling is a process or an act. Rather than having feelings, a person feels. That's my Marcel coming out there, right? The being and having. Okay. So rather than having feelings, a person feels. A feeling is not something that you possess. It's something that you enact. So the basic abstraction of an art creates a primary illusion, which is a semblance of the process of feeling or experiencing the world. As a virtual image of a feeling, these semblances are nearly always vital and organic. They capture the unfolding dynamism of lived experience. So to summarize all of this in a less technical way, what art does is it takes all of the complexity of experience or feeling and presents it in a disconnected way, which allows the artwork to function as a symbol for what it means to feel or experience. The art, so the artwork to function as a symbol for what it means to feel or experience. As a presentation, it gives you an image of feeling rather than a model of feeling. Right? Remember this image model distinction. So as a presentation, it gives you an image of feeling rather than a model of feeling. As an image, it displays or presents feeling to you in a unified way, or in a unified whole, sorry, or a gestalt. It doesn't seek to discursively or didactically define or model feeling. It shows you what feeling is rather than telling you how to feel. So discur in a discursive context, we're trying to tell you how to feel. That, that would be the idea. But we're not doing that. We're showing you what feeling is. This is an image of feeling, not a model for how to feel. So then, turning back to the possibility of a presentational philosophy, we need to ask the question, how can we develop a philosophy that shows rather than tells, so to speak? So hopefully we can keep all the technical <coughs> verbiage in mind here. I'm going to try and apply this to this idea of a presentational philosophy. I've already spoken too long about all this, so I'm going to just, yeah, go ahead. Sure. All of, I don't, where, I'm trying to see where I said all of the above, but yes. No, I, that's what I'm saying. Oh, okay. In, in reference to what language. Yes, of course. Um, it's, I, I just want to reiterate that majority of the time the artists fail at achieving yes. this realm yeah. of what Langer aspires philosophy as an art to achieve. Right. Yeah, if, if we're successful in creating this feeling tone or this quality or the, you know, this, uh, the attempt to make a symbol doesn't always work out, right? right. Yes, exactly, sure. Yeah, th uh, hopefully that makes sense, right? That's clear that we're not going to be successful 100% of the time, but this is what we're talking about trying to do. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The basic abstraction of philosophy needs to be something that can transform the actual into the virtual. Right? That's what we're saying. That's the idea of a basic abstraction. It needs to be something that can transform the actual into the virtual, meaning it can isolate or abstract an experience from the everyday and make it stand alone in a way that transforms the experience into something imaginative and ideal. The candidate that I would suggest is wonder. Right? As this abstraction, this way of making something stand alone as this image, right? I take Plato's claim that philosophy begins in wonder, Thalmazine, fairly seriously. I think wonder can transform the actual into the virtual in the same way that a gesture does in dance, or an action in a play, or a scene in the, in the pictorial arts, to take a few of Langer's examples of basic abstractions. I, we're going to have to unpack this as a group, because I don't have, you know, so just tell me what you think about all this. But, so that's, that's my candidate, that's my idea. And then my candidate uh, for, uh, so the primary illusion of philosophy needs to be something that can affect a semblance or illusion of a feeling. It needs to be a way of presenting feeling in a holistic and non-discursive way. My candidate is the illusion of wisdom. So 
wonder as this abstractive mode is hopefully able to present to you the image of what it feels like to be wise or something. That's what a philosopher is trying to do. Right? Uh, okay. So in other words, what makes good philosophy meaningful isn't that it creates a complex discursive language of terms and concepts. Philosophy is meaningful when it presents an experience, often embodied in meeting the philosopher themselves, or sometimes in their speaking or their writing, that affects a gestalt of what it feels like to be wise, or at least to love and pursue wisdom, right? <laughs> Philo, Sophia, you know, as Plato told us, we don't actually have to be wise to be a philosopher, we just have to be trying. So, so that's what we're presenting. We're presenting this image of the life in pursuit of wisdom. When you see and or encounter philosophy, that's what's being given to you is this feeling of what it feels like to pursue wisdom. Right? So the, the philosopher, as an artist and as an artwork, maybe, presents a semblance or image of wisdom. This is something that I think all great philosophers, including Bob, <laughs> right, uh, manage to accomplish. If we want philosophy to be vital in the classroom, in the culture at large, then I would argue that we philosophers should concern ourselves more with presenting wisdom, present, presenting, in Langer's sense, rather than only ever discoursing about it. It's one thing to merely tell a student what Plato said. It's another thing altogether to embody and present the feeling of Plato. What is the feeling of Plato? Right? Now, of course, obviously, we would want to give an image and also a model. Right? The ideal is to be both presentational and discursive in a, in a sophisticated and deep way. But... Um, I certainly know which one I tend to think is more powerful, and maybe that's just me. Maybe that's a feature of my personality. I have a guess which Langer would prefer. I'm interested to hear what Innes thinks, and all of you here have to say on that topic. That's it. Thank you. Please. Yeah. I yeah. Um, I have two images, whatever, I just, um, first of all, there's a book called The Master and the Emissary by Ian McGilchrist. Anybody heard of that? And, and the idea being, uh, the, uh, the master is the right brain, um, and the emissary is the left brain. And the master's in, in charge of being alive. I mean, the master is alive mm -hmm. and develops this left brain to say, you know, go out and get some data. Anyway, the point being, uh, you know, the left brain's taken over. It's all discursive. It becomes a life in itself. It's like, are you kidding? You know, you've forgotten, like, the whole purpose of yeah. going out there. But the other image I have is I'm thinking of being a tennis player, which I was, whatever. Um, and there's a place for discursive instruction. You know, you want to do this, you want to do that, let me explain this. There's also a place for showing instruction. Just watch, watch yourself, watch others. You know, I'm not putting it in words, just watch it. But ultimately, you want to get on the court and just do it, you know? And, and so in a way, you know, describing philosophy as a way to present meaning, ultimately you want people to live meaning, right? Mm -hmm. You want to just be meaning. If you, uh, all, you know, you're aspiring towards it. You want the day to be meaningful. Um, so there's a way in which even presentational symbolism needs to be internalized ultimately to be meaningful. You know, you hope that that having a great conversation and, and presenting these kind of meaningful images makes you go out without thinking about it and just, you know, take in the meaning of the world. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. anyway, what a great talk. Oh, what thank you. That's nice. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah to, so to respond to that, 
I actually just watched a very interesting video about a neuroscientist who had a stroke and the and I forget if how it works, but left brain, right brain, whichever. Yeah. So um, and she had a stroke which damaged the right brain, the rational controlling mind. And so she described and how interesting it would be for a neuroscientist to go through this because she said like for years the way that she saw the world was radically transformed because she only interpreted it through this feeling intuitive side we could say right and how so transitioning from that highly rational sort of worldview to this very emotive intuitive way of still experiencing the world still making sense of the world but not in this sort of we could say discursive sense and then as her brain sort of repaired itself and she re and sh as she said she's like i was happy to have those functions back right cuz yeah. now i could start to read and, and write and, and process in a more rational way yeah. but my whole experience was transformed by that because now i see the world in this and i try not to lose that sense of uh, you know that fe that approach to the world through feeling rather than just through language or discursivity yeah did you have a yeah. Oh, we, we'll come back to if you wanted to comment on that specifically. No, I mean I have I have another comment. Okay, yeah. good. So, uh, all right, one second, and then we'll go, and then we'll go there. Okay. Right. So, and the the other thing that I just wanted to mention that um, on that idea of like presenting or instruction versus just the showing, like in tennis or in, in other things, is I think of all of the the basic abstractions that Langer describes. Right? Can you? So if you were going to teach someone how to dance, you know, and, and it's, it's a cliche, but like, could you model how to gesture? Could, could you write out and see, you know, like we have that where you put the footsteps on the ground and then you have to do that. Like, you can model the dance, but you can't model the gesture of an artist, right? You can't just like describe to someone and break it down analytically, atomistically, and say, here are the atom, here are the atomic parts in relation of how Barishnikov, you know, like, you see, you can't, in a way, you can't do that. And maybe that feels like a cop out to say, but it, it seems so, so true. And ultimately, the person has to dance for themselves. I yeah. Mean, I, but, and all you can do as a pedagogically is to present it to them and say, look, here is. Here is an artist. Here, here is how this person. You know, I'm not a dancer, so but you know, like <laughs> a gesture, right? Like the I always you think of this sort of thing for me when you laying on dance, right? Like so, how does one? I, I'm a musician, so I'll, I'll do music instead, right? You you listen to four different recordings of the same piece, and the difference between one and the other is gesture. I, I know gesture is dance, but you know we get. It. Right? So I, I like Horowitz, as he's a, a classical pianist that I, I tend to like. And for whatever reason, just the way that he, yeah. just the, the emotiveness of how he plays, well, I, you know, like I'll hear one song and somebody else plays it, and it's fine, and then I hear him play it, and you're like crying, and just because of how, just the tiny little intricacies. And that's gesture, you know? So how does one teach that? How do you model that? Well, you can't in a way. Okay, so we'll go here and then, yeah, go ahead. Um, uh, I don't know, did, who, who was first, yeah. Yeah, uh, big fan of Corwitz. Oh, too. good, great. So, um, uh, it's a piece, by the way, it's not a song, it's a piece. Oh, okay. Um, so, the, since you've evoked uh, philosophy in a new key, mm -hmm. so key can mean many things, mm -hmm. but in music, it's a very specific thing. Uh, so I just want to throw this out there. There is a two albums of keyboard works by Johann Sebastian Bach. They are the bibles of all musicians. And this album traverses all 12 keys mm -hmm. that a keyboard instrument uh, is capable of. And that the mysterious thing about these two albums is that all the keys that are sort of uh, in the middle with lots lots of sharps and flats, those pieces tend to have this mysterious, uh, mysterious quality of this beauty and depth and the wonder and the wisdom that the outer keys seems to not have. And you can't transpose. You can't say, let me play 
this piece in the middle right. with six sharps, which is outrageously beautiful in depth, right. full of wonder, full of awe, in C major. <laughs> it will just sound wrong. Yeah. And I, I, and this is a mystery even in the classical music world. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't have an answer to why these particular keys for mm -hmm. Bach meant this particular kind of wonder right. in the composition. And by the way, these are pieces that are two parts. First part is a little more accessible. It's a little more spontaneous. Second part is called a fugue. They're called prelude and fugue. Fugue is a pure logical process in music. Um, it follows a logic, and that's the only way it works. And, but it emotes. It emotes. It, 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 in the hands of Bach and very, very few composers, this fugue form, uh, and I, I'd like to think I'm one of these composers who are fascinated by this this form. Is there it's, a question? It, um, it's, it's, I'm wrapping up. <laughs> it, it's that how is it possible that through this logical procedure that this tremendous amount of feeling and wonder and wisdom is coming out of these pieces? That's uh, I just, and in terms Excellent. of key, that is just something that I think about all the time. Yeah. Restate the last part again for me. So you say, so how the wonder and wisdom comes out of each key in particular? Each, each, uh, this process, expression. this very logical process of a fugue. Mm -hmm. Fugue is a logical process. So you're asking how could a logical process affect, produce, yeah. produce this kind of wonder? Yeah. I mean, so I, I don't want to get too bogged down in technical distinctions. Obviously, we're, if we're transposing what I'm in meaning to be a technical term applying to philosophy to a musical art form, then we would say, well, maybe it's not actually wonder, at least in this specific technical sense. But in the general way of like, I understand the, the point that you're making, right? Is how, to what degree does presentational forms rely on or can it use discursive logics to affect the feeling that it's trying to affect? I think is how I would understand the, the question that you're asking, right? Yeah, I mean, great question. It's kind of like art spans this whole spectrum and there are people that seem to just be all gesture in a way, like all emotive, all, and then there are people that are very highly logical, rational in whatever context that makes it, whether it's music or painting, that, like there are modes of that. And I want to elaborate a little bit though because what they don't know about you is that you're a writer in addition to being, you know, these other things. <coughs> Apply this, to what extent do, does your theoretical and conceptual knowledge of how to write affect the way that you write? Well, and, and that's the thing. So I guess what I would say, and this is, so I'm not a classical musician by training. I, I'm a vocalist. I took classical music courses. I have a lot of friends who are classical musicians, this sort of thing. But my response would be um, the, the logical form of it is only important to the extent that it's a vehicle that can carry the feeling, right? And sometimes we get bogged down in something like, um, you know, musical analysis. We, and we do the same in philosophy, right? But like I was just saying, we spend so much time analyzing the forms and the structures and the rational systems that we, we forget to actually talk about the feeling that was meant to be produced by this. Yeah, so if you're sitting around and just talking about the structure of the fugue and how Bach was in the counterpoint and then this and that, is that the means by which he created this feeling? Yes, in a way. It's the, the clay that he used to mold and create this effect. But it's not the work of art. I, I think that's what Langer would say, right? It, it, so the work of art is the illusion that is affected. And you can affect that through different techniques. And it could be a fugue, and it could be very contrapuntal and very precise and very baroque, or it could be you know, anything, right? Uh, it could be 12-tone, atonal music. Um, but what, what the artist is doing is creating that illusion of that feeling, that image of a feeling. So when you listen to Bach, and you, as you rightly said, right? I mean, the, the feeling that is produced 
by each of the works in these different keys is completely different and is completely specific to that form. Now, to ask why that form is integral to that feeling is a great question, right? Like, why can you only affect this feeling in this particular key? Why could you not get that exact same feeling if you transposed it to any other key? I don't know. Did, does, does David have to be carved in marble? If it, you know, if it was, I, I don't know. Um, that's, that's for the artist, I guess, to decide. It's to take the, the means that they have available, whatever means, to create the, the feeling that they're trying to create. Or to present, maybe I should say present. We right. are out of time. Bob okay. has his hand up, but Bob is going to get to say everything Bob wants to say. So, <laughs> yeah. so let's move to our let's move to our break. I know this is an incredibly stimulating discussion. <laughs> Bob, we've got to move. And so uh, Adrian, I'll be here all day. Feel yeah, free to yeah. 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 and uh, and so we'll go to. Am I to, am I to actually uh, to, to make my comments after after both Adrian and yeah. Jared? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. so, I have a lot to say about. <laughs> I'm excited. Today, but I have been uh, yeah. holding my tongue. I'm excited. Right. Yeah. 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 So you, 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 you'll have time. All right. So uh, let's take our little break. Let's thank Jared. Thank you.